this book is really something uh, very special to me. When I began out in uh, my work in data privacy, uh, it was with working with John at the Department of Homeland Security as a law student where I clerked. Uh, I didn't really know too much about this field before then, uh, and John really introduced me to um, this subject matter. And if it wasn't for John, it's quite likely that I never would have made it to the Berkman Center. So this is really quite a, uh, a special thing for me to be able to be here and talk about this book. Uh, so a bit about my background. Um, I'm a research fellow here at the Berkman Center. I'm also a, a, a private practice lawyer at Perkins Coie. Uh, I've been working in the data privacy field both in the United States and in Europe under English law. And uh, the focus of my work at the Berkman Center and private practice is really European and global uh, data privacy law and the conflicts which it presents. Um, uh, with me is John Croft. He's the lead author and really the architect of this book. He is uh, the former Deputy Chief Privacy Officer of the Department of Homeland Security, current Head of Privacy at Northrop Grumman, uh, 10 plus years in the State Department, and is a, just has an abundance of knowledge and resource on this subject matter. Um, John? Well, thanks very much, Neil. I hope everybody can hear me okay through the miracle of Skype. Uh, I've got thumbs up, so that's good. Uh, I just want to say, first off, uh, Greetings from Washington, D.C., and I do really appreciate uh, Berkman's flexibility, and of all places, to be uh, technically savvy, I would expect Berkman to be uh, able to, to manage this quite well. So thank you, uh, Berkman Center, for uh, allowing me the, the ability to, uh, to come to you from, from Skype uh, in, in Washington. Um, I wanted, I'd like to get a sense from, uh, as, as we go around the room, just briefly when, when you do introductions, just kind of everybody's background, if it's, if it's law, if it's international affairs, if it's uh, IT or internet, um, just to help kind of gauge, uh, where, where everybody's interest might be. Uh, I'll just say briefly about myself. Uh, I've, I've kind of been, um, I wouldn't say I had a pre-planned career, um, been somewhat of a nomad, but uh, I've been at uh, work as an attorney at the Department of Justice. I uh, worked then at the State Department, uh, where I started to do privacy and uh, Freedom of Information Act law. Um, I I left that to go uh, to the most illogical place possible, which was a former Soviet Union country of Turkmenistan, uh, for two years with my wife, who was a Foreign Service officer. Came back and I could see that privacy was still very big on an international level, uh, and and moved over to Homeland Security, uh, where I I worked with them uh, building an international privacy team and then then uh, serving as deputy for their their privacy office and then I've continued uh, to work in uh, privacy in the private sector uh, now since uh, uh, really 2012. Uh, trained as an attorney, but I've, I've hopped on both sides of the fence between law and policy, um, all around privacy, because I think privacy has got one leg in law, one leg in policy, and, and one leg in, in IT. So uh, it's a fascinating area. I would say that privacy picked me. I didn't really pick privacy. Um, I, I'm going to basically also give my, my one disclaimer, which is the remarks you're going to hear from me today are really my own personal remarks. They don't reflect the remarks of uh, uh, the past government agencies I've worked for or my current employer. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing your backgrounds. Uh, now we're going to, uh, John's going to give a bit of uh, insight into what he was thinking when preparing the book and what it really means for him. I'm going to give some thoughts on the book myself. Uh, then we're going to open it up to a discussion. I'll lead with a, a few questions and then to the rest of the room. Um, John? Thanks, Neil. And I guess I'll just open by saying uh, I'll explain the motivations for the book. It, it is, um, I'll, I'll say that the old saying that necessity is the mother of invention, well, that's really what prompted the book. Um, I found myself after uh, September 11th, both at the State Department and then later at Homeland Security, uh, involved in a number of, of uh, negotiations uh, with a lot of our European friends to share um, personal information. Um, and it started uh, around really um, with Australia for lost and stolen passport information. There was no uh, 
there was no established or systematized way to, to share that that type of information between lost and stolen passports between our two countries. Um, that that evolved further um, with both State Department and Homeland Security. I participated on um, three different negotiations over something called the Passenger Name Record Agreement or the PNR Agreement, as it became known, um, that was involving the exchange of um, personal information held by the airlines uh, where, the, where those flights were uh, outbound out of the EU into the U.S. and and what information could be shared under the European uh, directive. Um, it it also extended into a negotiation around what they called at one time uh, the high-level contact group. It's been called different things, uh, the umbrella group, but it was uh, really intended to be um, a, a negotiation to come up with an established set of principles of, of privacy and data protection to share law enforcement information. And during those negotiations, um, I, I was, as a lawyer, I wanted to see what had been done before, what was the prior practice. And there really was no one single source uh, to go and look at how had these information sharing agreements gone on before. I thought, surely uh, this has been done before. Perhaps there's a reference tool. Well, there wasn't. And so I, I really did this because I wanted a reference tool. I wanted uh, a collection of um, information sharing agreements that the U.S. had engaged in to, to really show uh, how had this been done uh, before, really to have as, as a handbook. Um, and, and I recall early on as a, as a very junior attorney at the State Department, there was a, um, the one thing I had always hoped to work on were, were treaties and, and international agreements. And there is a wonderful book out there that is that's out of print, but I always remembered it. Um, it's called The Treaty Maker's Handbook. Uh, and it's actually by uh, former high-level uh, UN official Hans Blix. And it's basically a guide of, of how an agreement should look, what kind of provisions it should have in it. So I kind of took that as my model. And I really then went back and tried to pull all of the, the past information sharing agreements that uh, I knew of, uh, that is, as far as I could find, they went all the way back, um, going back to the 70s, um, of, of all places that, that seemed one of them that seemed the most unlikely, but they had actually a couple dozen information assuring agreements were um, the Social Security Administration engaged in what they called totalization agreements. That was sharing of pension information between our different citizens who would, who would say, go to work in Italy, uh, pay into their pension system, and, and uh, need a record of what they'd paid into, sent back the U.S. and vice versa if an Italian citizen came to the U.S. to work. So there, there had been this long-standing practice uh, of these information sharing agreements. So that's, it's, it's not very sexy to say that, but it's, it is really just a reference book in that way. So from a practical standpoint, that was, that was motivation number one. The second motivation was, was really more around um, when we got into a discussion with with our European friends, it, it seemed to me as if we were doing this at, at year one, as if this was the first time anybody was trying to engage in information sharing. Uh, I found this to be especially true around the PNR agreement. And it, it was almost as if there was just a, uh, an absence of any uh, knowledge over the prior practice. So the book was also meant to to kind of uh, be a, a documentation or a, of an established record that there has been a prior practice around these information sharing agreements, and so it was meant to put put on the record what our what our um, what the U.S. practice had been in sharing with uh, our European friends and allies and, and other uh, friendly countries around the world. So it, it established that and. Um, one of the trends that I did notice in doing this is that uh, information sharing had previously been very, um, it been, been kind of handled at a very subject matter or technical, you know, level uh, 
uh, without a lot of fanfare, without a lot of uh, uh, media attention to it. Uh, again, I'll go back and use the example of the Social Security totalization agreements. Um, they were very straightforward in the beginning. They had a simple couple of clauses or a couple of sentences that would address um, that the two countries will mutually recognize each other's uh, frameworks for privacy and information sharing. But after 9-11, uh, these very simple mutual recognition clauses became much more complex and uh, there was much more attention paid to them. Uh, and so the agreements for information sharing became much more, um, uh, much more detailed. And they were really uh, following common principles that had been established in both the U.S. and Europe around the fair information practice principles that had been uh, documented uh, in both the European Directed and Directive and U.S. Privacy Act and also in the OECD uh, guidelines of 1980. So um, this book really is, is, as you see through the more, more modern agreements, um, follows the principles that are, that are enumerated under the fair information practice principles. And, and I really do try to give examples uh, at each stage of what, say, uh, a purpose limitation principle would look like in an agreement. Uh, so again, it's a very practical kind of a guide, but meant to, to really put on the record what our practice has been. Um, and I would say also, uh, you know, as, as this started out back in the 70s, information sharing was much more technical. Now it's become extremely political. Uh, all you have to do is open the open the paper and just see uh, the, the tensions that are going on that you can read about between the information sharing worlds and in the U.S. and, and EU is probably got the most press. Um, and it's it's both in the commercial sector and also in the law enforcement sector as well. Um, I, I think that, that might be enough just to sort of set up a, a the in the premise of of why I did this, and I want to leave some plenty of time for um, discussion. So I, I'm going to pause here and really turn things over to Neil. And 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 I want to say that I met Neil uh, one summer when he was clerking at, at Homeland Security, and I was still really leading on the the international privacy work, and he was very interested in it. And I was extremely happy to have him as a as a willing assistant to help do research on the book. Uh, later, because uh, um, he he was willing to do it and interested, and um, so he's he's really been quite a resource. So I'll, I'll pause here and and just say, Neil, um, you know, you why don't you kind of comment on on where you saw the book going and what you saw the book uh, uh, doing in the the field of international privacy. I spent the majority of my career in private practice. Um, so what I've thought a great deal about is how these international data sharing agreements impact private entities, uh, NGOs, corporations. Um, I'd like to give a couple examples of, of how that's really played out over the last few years uh, in my experience. So we've talked about the passenger name record agreement. Uh, other agreements also exist that facilitate the, the sharing of personal data, personal information between a private organization, here being airlines, over to um, the government. Another good example is the terrorist finance tracking program to allow the sharing of data from private organizations over to government. There are still many other instances where we don't have agreements in place, and I think it's interesting to, to focus on those because um, it puts these private entities in an interesting conflict of laws scenario. So, for example, uh, we have a, a great culture of non-governmental organizations operating around the world, uh, NGOs. Uh, to function, they need to receive uh, money, essentially. Uh, they get the money from donors, from governments, from all kinds of sources. When they're given money from most uh, organizations, including governments, there's a, a grant agreement that has stringent uh, vetting clauses. Uh, they require uh, to ensure that the, to be able to check that the money is going where it's meant to. The U.S. government has a particular interest in ensuring that it's not funding, uh, say, terrorist activities or other activities that it would not think well of. 
Historically, most NGOs did this vetting internally, but over the last number of years, due to a change in uh, climate, um, several uh, U.S. government departments, agencies, have begun to do uh, vetting themselves, requesting that the NGOs hand over data of their key employees and their partner organizations when operating abroad. Um, these organizations will be subject to their own local laws, and by giving the, the data to the U.S., there's an interesting question of how does that exchange happen. When we look at the passenger name record agreement or the terrorist finance tracking program, there's a specific framework in place. But here, the organizations have to decide, am I going to risk being breached with my own local law without a government-to-government -government agreement framework being in existence, or am I not going to take the money? It, it presents a lot of difficult issues. And one of the things that we'll talk about today is when do we get to a point where the government decides we need to put in place this framework, we need to allow uh, these entities to have legal certainty to be able to, to conduct operations. Another example which I think is quite interesting is how personal data is transferred out of the European Union to the United States. Um, many of you may be familiar with uh, the US, EU US Safe Harbor Program. This is one of many data transfer mechanisms which can be used. In addition, you have EU model contracts, binding corporate rules, um, consent for very limited purposes, uh, legal principle, the, several others. But what's interesting, and I think many of you are aware, the uh, EU US Safe Harbor program has been under a lot of scrutiny the last couple of years. Um, there are questions about when information is provided over to the US authorities, uh, to law enforcement. But what's interesting is that the alternative, which is recommended by the um, European Commission and the European Parliament, is say, well, if we don't want to use safe harbor while that's being worked out, you should put in place a model contract. But the difference between model contract as a mechanism as compared to safe harbor, the data will transfer in either scenario. But under safe harbor, the private entities that are participating will be in compliance with their laws. And it's that the, some of the European authorities don't like the way that allows data to then be sent on the, the government. In a model contract, it's the entities themselves may possibly be in breach of that model contract. The data will still go over to the, the authorities, but the difference being they're saying, well, if you decide to use this, then you'll be in breach and they can seek recourse against you. And I find this interesting because the data flows are still happening and there seems to be a preference in putting the private entities in breach of their contractual obligations um, rather than necessarily solving it on diplomatic channels, which is what is currently uh, is being sought after is to find this resolution, but at the same time, uh, safe harbors in the courts for the European Court of Justice, and, and it's interesting which one will, will win out and be addressed first. Um, so these are some of the way I think about these issues uh, and the things that I'm working on uh, with this book. I'd now I'd like to open up to questions. I'm going to ask John a, a few to get things going. Um, so to begin with, uh, John, when does the U.S. government decide that it's necessary to enter into a data sharing agreement? What are the catalysts? Well, it, it's it's really a a wide spectrum of catalysts. Uh, you could say, you know, from a purely commercial standpoint, uh, there would be a desire to enter into an agreement, and, and an example of that would be uh, the Safe Harbor Agreement of 1990. I think somebody expressed interest in that uh, as we went around the room. Uh, and that was really a recognition by U.S. companies that, you know, there is this 1995 European Data Protection Directive that that put restrictions on information flowing out of the country. So uh, that was a wake-up call uh, and really motivated uh, the commercial world to, to enter into that agreement. Um, and then at the other end of the, the, the scale would be uh, uh, law enforcement, our national security uh, counterterrorism concerns. Um, again, following 9-11, uh, you had a number of laws that were passed by Congress, for example, that uh, law that really changed. There was, there was a regime called the, the Visa Waiver Program. And it's, it's a program that, that countries want to be qualified for uh, because it is a very streamlined and expeditious way for your citizens uh, to get visas to, to enter into the U.S. And Congress set um, some statutory requirements for countries to enter into the visa waiver program, and one of them was that the, um, the country enter into a inter information sharing agreement around uh, counterterrorism uh, information. And so that was, that was pushed by statute. And, um, you know, 
you know, but really there can be a wide mix of, of reasons uh, to, to open up these, these agreements, foreign policy, as I said, commercial immigration considerations, also um, perhaps an assessment of whether or not the, uh, the partner is, you know, has a, um, uh, an existing framework of privacy laws or is, has a respect for the rule of law. So there is sort of these, these additional uh, extra considerations that, that um, go on. Um, and I think they're only going to increase in, in the need to, to have more and more, um, more and more agreements in this area. I know that the, the TTIP discussions with, with the European Union, the, the free trade negotiations that are underway, there's, there's, a big, um, uh, there's a big debate right now as to whether or not data protection will be an element of that particular agreement. It's still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to follow up on that, uh, uh, on that question, uh, another thing that's quite interesting is when, in your experience, when the U.S. is negotiating these agreements, what are its key concerns? What are its must-haves in the agreement to, to, in order to be thought to walk away uh, successful? Well, I think for, for – I'll speak to as, – as, as a privacy voice in the room at the table on these negotiations, what – what I'm looking for as a privacy advocate is is that there be an adherence to the fair information practice principles, which is what what the U.S. framework is built around under the Privacy Act of 1974. Um, but a lot of this is is driven initially by the question as to what is the primary purpose of the agreement? Is the primary purpose of the agreement really centered around information sharing, or is it centered around something else where Personal information is somewhat secondary um, to the whole arrangement, and, and an example of that might be, um, and I, I talk about this in the book somewhat. An example of that might be um, where you have uh, SEC has in, in engaged in a number of international agreements to do cross-border enforcement of security violations, securities violations. Privacy there is not at the, is not the high the highest priority to um, that agreement. So it might not get the full set of protections that you would normally see in, say, uh, the PNR agreement, where the principal purpose of the PNR agreement was to share personal information. So what we're what we're looking for from a U.S. privacy standpoint is uh, following the well-established fair information practice. Uh, uh, practice principles, and the result being mutual recognition that the other country recognizes your privacy framework. Um, you know, mutual recognition is 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 now got a new. I think it's, a lot of people refer to it um, under a different nomenclature. They call it interoperability, but I'm using the old-fashioned term mutual recognition um, under under the European framework. Uh, they, they've kind of taken it as a one-way approach saying, uh, we will decide if you're adequate or not. Um, some people could say that that is a one-directional, it's no longer mutual recognition, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's one-way recognition. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, anything, uh, anything you want to add, Neil? Um, no, I, I think that was, um, that was great. Uh, just one last question. How have you seen the uh, the climate change uh, after the the Snowden revelations in, in trying to negotiate these agreements? Yeah, I mean, I have um, my time in government service. Uh, I left after the Snowden revelation, so I've all just been watching it from uh, from the newspapers and then the press. Uh, it, it has been interesting, though. Clearly, um, uh, the Snowden revelations have had an impact uh, on Safe Harbor. Um, there were, I think, 13 reforms that were presented by the European Union uh, to the safe harbor arrangements that, that were a result of uh, or, or were post Snowden. And of those, I think at least three were national security issues about uh, how is that information shared with law enforcement? How is it shared with your intelligence services? And that the... Um, uh, the European Union has asked that 
the, um, the U.S. side, that is the Department of Commerce, address these national security concerns. That's a, that's a very tough issue because um, the safe harbor agreement is really, it is in a commercial channel and it really, uh, both the Department of Commerce and the European Union side, uh, the DPAs, it's outside their, their areas of what they call competence in the European Union or outside of the, the Department of Commerce's jurisdiction. So those are, those are difficult questions to address and uh, how they how they will address them remains to be seen. I know that there is the the case before the European Court of Justice that is expected to come out. I think the Advocate General's opinion is going to come out next month, June 24, which will maybe be an indicator as to how the European Union views um, the post Snowden world as it impacts uh, Safe Harbor. Um, the other thing I would say is um, the way post Snowden has affected uh, these negotiations is, I, I mentioned at the top of the, the, the presentation, there's been an ongoing uh, negotiation uh, for law enforcement sharing uh, between the U.S. and the EU. Uh, most recently, uh, I think it was Congressman Sensenbrenner has introduced a, a bill uh, in the House that would actually give non-U.S. persons rights of judicial redress in U.S. courts under certain circumstances under the Privacy Act, which, which as the Privacy Act is written now, um, basically allows judicial redress only for U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents. So that's, that's quite, you know, that's, that, that is something that uh, you could say was a direct uh, directly influenced by post Snowden, and in fact, uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce and a long list of other uh, tech companies have come out in support of that legislation. So that's certainly, um, you know, that's certainly all uh, because of I think the, the Snowden post Snowden revelations. And then the last area, I think, um, not so much around agreements, but it, it does affect the cloud area. I think somebody expressed interest in in um, cloud storage, and um, I think that that the Snowden issue has been used by a lot of European companies to say, you know, we want to localize our clouds now because we can't trust you all and on the other side of the Atlantic because of um, what's going on over there. So uh, definitely lots of uh, lots of impacts. One thing I might add to that, there's been an interesting fallout on private companies uh, that are active elsewhere in the world, uh, particularly in the EU. Um, one of uh, the data transfer mechanisms I mentioned a moment ago, binding corporate rules, is really considered the, the gold seal uh, of data transfer arrangements. Um, not too many entities have it, maybe 50 worldwide. Uh, those that do, it's not just a, a means of legal compliance, but it's supposed to attest to uh, that organization's ability to be a good data, pri data privacy citizen. Um, I've worked on the, these binding corporate rules for several organizations, and after Snowden revelations, it instantly became much more difficult to get approvals for American companies. I have had uh, local governments and data protection authorities approve binding corporate rules in member states only to have the political arm of the government, the Ministry of Justice, to what should have been a, a rubber stamp seal of approval, um, hold up the process and turn it into a political engagement and, and ask us to, to really lobby behind the scenes. And this was just before unprecedented. And the interesting thing is, this is these are organizations which are trying to be good data proxy citizens that want to be compliant with the law, but they're essentially being being frustrated um, due, to, due to what's happened. Um, so this time, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions you might have. Um, we have a microphone that we don't need to use, and we'll put it back. <laughs> Please. Hi, my name is Edgar Potato. I am a former law enforcement officer from the United States Customs and Border Protection Agency and in the, from Homeland Security, and I did handle PNR a lot since then. And uh, as a federal officer, we were, I, I always came under strict, strict scrutiny. You know, I, I handled those documentation. Any flights coming to the United States and entering U.S. space, uh, it was three hours before uh, the flight entered into, into, into United States uh, space. 
we were given that documentation, not before that. Any other information, <clears throat> well, the documentation at that time, between 2003 and 2007, it came on paper. I don't know how it's happening now. And then, you know, we would use the PA. I was part of the intelligence uh, unit and also, and we were part of the enforcement team. And uh, I don't know what happened after that. We would give it to our supervisors after we used it. And then, um, um, uh, what do you call the, as far as, uh, I worked also the seaport. Anything, any commerce that came into the, into the United States for LQE, landed quantity, landed quantity verification, that would, uh, they had to comply with CTPAN, Customs Trade uh, Partnership Against the Terrorism. And there's a certain score there because you have to meet the ACS and AES, uh, automated export system, and automated uh, custom selectivity uh, is the criteria. For, air, for pa passengers entering the United States, you've got to meet the TAC for people coming from uh, what do you call uh, visa waiver countries? You got to, you know, NTC, National Targeting Center in Langley, wherever they're, they're called, wherever they're based, they would get a descrambled uh, information about, you know, potential uh, candidates, I would call them. And then if, we, if, if there was anything given to us, it would come to us through, through the uh, tax system, terrorist affiliated uh, country system, and then we would, we would process it from there. But uh, you know everything at that time was uh, extremely, extremely. Um, um, you know we were as a federal officer, we always came under scrutiny, like making sure the information never really went out to anybody else. So even if I saw something, I would just I, I didn't see it. I, two minutes later, I, I said I forgot. So it was like it, it came under strict scrutiny. Probably it is really advanced now. And, and just just to add to that, that's a, that's a very good point from from sort of being on the ground with. With actually using that data um, under the under the different agreements, the PNR agreements, um, it's worth noting that um, not only does the Privacy Office for Homeland Security do oversight, but once a year we would have a delegation come over from the European Union, and we would have a at least a two to three day review where they would come out and actually go do site visits. Um, to go to uh, um, uh, CBP and, and see their operations, and they would do a review of the entire process uh, to satisfy themselves under the agreement that we were following uh, how PNR was being handled. So that's that's just to give you a level of of scrutiny that goes on um, with some of these arrangements with the U.S. government. I know in, in a different arrangement. Uh, with the Department of Treasury, I believe it was the um, uh, the terrorist financing uh, information sharing arrangement. Um, they actually have a um, the way the agreement is worded is uh, an eminent uh, European expert uh, is to come over and do the review. So it's, it's almost an, uh, even a higher level of um, of um, in, I wouldn't say. I, a higher level of intrusion, you would say, maybe from a foreign government, actually to come in and, and sit and, and make a determination as to whether the agreement um, is operating properly or not. So one of the new features, as I mentioned, I mean, it used to be there's, there was just a simple set of sentences that would have uh, mutual recognition pronounced in the agreement. We've gotten now to the point where there is regular oversight, annual oversight by uh, the foreign government uh, participating in the agreement to do a review. Great. Great. Um, um. Other questions? Questions, questions, comments? So John mentioned uh, Sensenbrenner's bill um, that would extend protection to um, uh, non-residents of the U.S. O over data. Uh, and you said the um, IP and tech industry was in favor of that. And that surprised me a little bit because I would assume that um, why do you want to increase your liability if uh, you can avoid it? So I was wondering if you could expand upon uh, the, the thinking there a little bit. Sure. Um, and again, I say this as uh I'm now, I guess, retired, and but I'm an interested sideline observer because I I lived through so much of that, so I am very interested as to all, all of those things. Um, the Sensenbrenner bill, I, I've looked at it over once, and it it isn't as, um, the way the media reported it is, it was just to give European Union citizens only uh, 
rights on, of judicial redress. And if it had been, if, if that was truly the case, that would be highly discriminatory against the rest of the world. However, if you read the bill, it, it actually says that um, a determination will be made on a country by country basis as to whether their citizens may make uh, may have the rights of judicial redress. But the more interesting point is the one that you raise, which is why would this group of companies and you can go online, I think, and look at the Department of Com or you no, know, uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce has a copy of the letter online. Um, but all the big companies, Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, all the ones that, that the, the EU loves to uh, uh, kind of love to go after uh, signed on to this letter. And, and I mean, if you think about it, it really is no skin off of their nose because what they're asking for is that the, the U.S. government amend the Privacy Act of 1974. It doesn't apply to companies. It applies to the U.S. government. So no one is going to be making a claim against Google or Facebook under this, this amendment. It's going to be the burden of the U.S. government to, to take that on. Now, um, way back when, um, the, uh, when the Privacy Act was drafted, there was some OMB guidance that said uh, when you get into these mixed systems where you've got U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens, if you can try to treat it as 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 if everybody has Privacy Act rights, but um, at DHS, the way we solve that is we came up with a policy and we said if you're not a U.S. citizen, we'll give you administrative rights, but you can't go into court. Only Congress can can change the law on that. So um, I have no idea what the likelihood is of the 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 bill passing because I don't know what the constituency really holds for this. I mean, are these, if these companies are serious, how hard are they going to lobby? I don't know. Um, and I know uh, former Secretary, or former Attorney General Holder actually said he would commit to go to Congress um, to push for this added right. I, I don't know what the new Attorney General's position is on this, but I hope that answers your question. It makes a lot of sense. I would also... Uh like to add, as far as organizations deciding to differentiate how they're going to treat individuals and, which, and how they're going to comply with law as they structure their business, this has been something that's been around for, for quite some time, as any multinational organization will be subject to different requirements each jurisdiction. If you go onto their websites and you read their privacy policy and try to get a deeper dive into how they're, they're structuring their privacy, you'll see that some of these organizations try to thread the needle and afford sort of rights and protections to based on where either you're located or their data is located. But a lot of other organizations, they have a concern. Well, people might go on, they'll see this, and we, we don't want the public to perceive us as only giving certain rights to, say, people in the EU and not for them to Americans. Uh, one of these areas where it becomes very clear is the topic of data subject rights, the right to request a, a copy of your data, to correct it, delete it, to, to block it. Um, and many times we'll see in privacy policy, will say, if you're a citizen of the European Union or if you're a resident of the EU, if your data is in the EU, they'll try to carve it out. Um, but in uh, ever-increasing rate, that's not happening. And a good example is if you look at Facebook, you can now go on to Facebook, it doesn't matter where you are, and pull off a copy of your data. This really is stemming from an obligation under European law, but it's open to Americans, people in South America, people in Russia, anywhere you are, uh, they're extending this right. And I think this is a, a reflection of the globalization of privacy. A very oddly silent Berkman crowd. I would like to say, I mean, I think what's, 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 and I'll, I'll mention just, I, I really, I, I'm interested in watching to see whether a global privacy framework will emerge or not. Um, I mean, you, you sort of have, I mean, very, very roughly, you have the European model, which, which really is an omnibus approach where, where data protection is a fundamental human right. Then you have the U.S. model, which is a much more sectoral approach. I mean, it's, it's all depending on what type of data is and what sector you're in, you're going to have a different, you may have a different law that applies. And then you have the rest of the world, which is kind of deciding where they want to go. Do they want a blend of both? Do they want to go with a European approach uh, or, or kind of still wait and watch? 
Um, and and I'm I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm confident that this can be worked out eventually. We we seem to be able to work out global standards in other areas of um, international commerce and, and standards. So why should privacy not be able to, to work out a global arrangement of some type? I know uh, the UN is actually there's there has been calls in the in the United Nations to to come up uh, address a convention around this. Uh, whether that will happen, I don't know. But to me, it's just it's indicating that there is more and more interest in um, in trying to find a, a global framework. Yes, please. What effect would the proposed Trans-Pacific Treaty have on privacy, either here or in the other countries that sign it? I'm sorry, the, the transmission was broken there. I just heard Pacific Treaty. Could you repeat? repeat? <clears throat> Um, the question was, how do you view the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Trade Agreement impacting privacy and what might come out of that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I wish I had followed that closer. I don't know. I really don't know to the extent that privacy has been uh, the focus of, of any prolonged negotiation there. I mean, um, I think that the Europeans are watching are watching what happens with the Trans-Pacific Agreement to see, you know, it, will that set any kind of a precedent for what happens with their with their agreement? But I, I just haven't heard of privacy being a, a big focus with the Pacific Agreement. We could add that uh, in the Transatlantic Agreement, many Europeans have called for for privacy to well, actually it's quite split. Some call for privacy to be taken off the table, some want to be put on the table. Um, and I guess the main obstacle is that much of trade negotiations are behind closed doors, and what we see is really a, a brief summary into what is going on. So the transparency is definitely an issue. I mean, I, I will I will add to that that I mean, there is a, a, a within APEC there is a um, there's a privacy framework from 2005 that um, that. Uh, basically follows the fair information practice principles with one additional principle and that is a principle of um of harm that that harm really has to be part of uh of any showing of of uh, in a in a privacy uh framework and within APEC they have been developing um a uh a, a basically cross border privacy regime i think they call it a CB PR and um, you know it's it's really looking to try to to say that any country that signs on to these principles under the APEC um, privacy framework and and uh, can demonstrate that they have a privacy enforcement authority can be part of this regime. It's it's still very early going. Um, the U.S. has has signed up. I believe Mexico and Japan have expressed some interest and uh, and possibly Canada. So. Um, APEC is, is, you know, it's, uh, will certainly have a lot of trade clout um, and may have some influence on the Pacific uh, negotiations. And 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 while I mean, I'll, I'll just keep talking unless, unless people have questions. Um, and it's it's outside of the the, the area of agreements, but it's. Um, uh, I think another area, interesting area to watch is the, the right to be forgotten, which was the Google case that came out of Spain. And there are questions right now as to, um, you know, some some in Europe want to see that that right to be forgotten uh, applied extraterritorially um, worldwide. And you know, Google is maintaining well, they'll they will adhere to the uh, the European Court of Justice's opinion within the European Union, but they're not going to apply it worldwide. And so, um, again, this is, you know, this is a bigger global question and, and uh, uh, it's an intersection between privacy and international law and, and where that comes out will be, I think, will be fascinating. And to, I guess, go a bit further on the topic of the right to be forgotten, it really is a good case study of the globalization of privacy and how countries are working together. So. In the EU itself, the European Commission and uh, the Article 20 Working Party has called for a harmonization of criteria as to how they evaluate right to be forgotten cases. But what we're seeing is each member state, as they go and try their own cases uh, in front of the courts and with the DPA, 
their criteria are not all the same. And so you have uh, member states, uh, sovereign countries, uh, trying to have a measure of autonomy in how they're going to be decided, yet the, the EU at the top saying we want to bring it under one regime, and it creates this conflict. Um, another example on this topic, uh, many have, may have seen that Facebook was recently uh, in trouble with the Belgian Data Protection Authority. Um, the way European data privacy law is structured is that competency um, uh, basically for Facebook goes, goes to Ireland. I'll, I'll save you the, the long legal explanation, uh, but by establishing in the EU, it goes to one member state. Um, with privacy, because it tends to be something that can be very important to people, very important to governments, uh, you'll see that countries will sometimes try to assert jurisdiction where it's questionable. And um, as privacy is further globalized, even within a contract as the EU or internationally, it's quite difficult, even where you have an international framework in place, to ensure that all the, the actors, including the governments, are going to... Uh, really uh, toe the line, as they say. Any other questions or comments? We often talk about the internet here as being um, based upon um, giving away our personal information. Um, that, you know, they say if something is free, then you're the product. Um, and yet, this seems like it could fly in the face, in particular, of European notions of privacy um, and, and data protection. And so I'm curious about uh, where we're going to come down. Is Are we going to see the Europeans, at least in a business-to-business -business environment, uh, allow for third, more readily third-party data sharing, cloud storage, everything uh, else? Um, or is Facebook going to have to do what the Belgians uh, want to do and do it around the rest <coughs> of the world, as you were suggesting uh, they're doing with some of their privacy policies? Big, big question. I'm sorry, but... John, would you like to take a... Uh... Well, I, I'll, I'll just make some observations, probably not well thought out, but... I, I mean, I notice, you know, companies like Facebook and Google are they're building very large uh, uh, server farms in in Europe. So I think that they recognize um, that there's going to be some localization coming their way. I think that's that's the direction that uh, the European Union is looking to reform their their data protection directive into a regulation, and in many ways, it's going to be. It's going to have some stricter controls around um, around the internet and around localization. Um, so I think that's why some of these big companies are doing what they're doing. Um, the most extreme example, which is not EU, but just just to put it out there to illustrate the point, is um, Russia has a, a very um, draconian law that is about to go into effect, which really requires that the data can't leave Russia. It, it, it has to stay in Russia, and that, that is a, sort of an extreme example of localization. Um, I think, you know, this, you're, you're right, I mean, it runs counter to um, the idea of a cloud. I mean, a cloud is supposed to be efficient and borderless, and uh, um, the, the European Union has made no, they, they've been very direct about saying, look, uh, we need time for some of our, our tech companies to catch up, so in some ways this is almost a... Uh, a protective measure, but um, again, my personal observations only. I would also just, just add to that is um, there really is not enough case law in this area yet, and when you see reports that came out of Belgium uh, and other reports from different uh, governments around the world, a lot of this is the regulator making a statement and an opinion, and it hasn't gone through the courts. Quite often, it, when it does, they, uh, it comes out differently. Uh, regulators are known to be a bit more aggressive. You can take a lot of liberties when asserting jurisdiction in a uh, opinion or a report than you might be able to take and say in front of a court. Um, and so there's definitely a difference between what we see in case law and to what we see maybe coming out of the commission or a, uh, a member state case or, or anywhere else in the world. The gentleman in red had a question. I wanted to ask a question about this, this idea of setting up data centers in the EU, does the physical location actually matter if the company is an American company? 
Is that, well, that's a debate I've heard a number of times in, in the EU. For what purpose? Though? Well, when it comes to deciding whether de certain data is to be handed over to U.S. authorities. Well, uh, if it is a U.S. company. I was going to say, for example, I mean that was that was a big issue in the Google case. Uh, you know, Google v Spain is, I mean, Spain asserted jurisdiction over uh, Google because it was on the basis actually of. Uh, of advertising, uh, that that they were able to claim jurisdiction over the American Google uh, headquarters. So I think companies are recognizing that that you know they're they're going to come under the the jurisdiction of Europe. So they may have to actually uh, put themselves in a in a position where they're they are local in case there are going to be these restrictions on moving the data out. And in regards to the cloud providers, what you'll see if you get into the agreements is that most of the big cloud providers will now allow you to either designate the country or region of storage. Um, that's intended to allow companies to better comply with their own local laws. So you don't have to necessarily address data transfer obligations if the data isn't leaving that country. I guess the question then becomes if you have an organization that's storing data wholly in a, so if you have say Microsoft, you have Microsoft to Azure, you're a customer in Europe and you select a, a member state in Europe to store your data um, for, but you're say maybe running this through the US as the, uh, the client but for your European customers you're allowed to stay there. Does the, the US courts have authority to issue a subpoena onto Microsoft to get the data on behalf of this American company which is being stored exclusively in Europe? Uh, that I think uh, we're still waiting to see come out and there's be interesting find out what happens. Any other last questions or comments? We have a couple more minutes. What did you guys have for lunch? This data centers being set up in Europe and if the data cannot leave in the European countries to come to the United States, that means uh, you know, I've been studying uh, servers for the last couple of years, and there's something called as uh, Active Directory. And inside Active Directory, you have the GPOs, Global Policy Objects, Group Policy Objects. The Group Policy, uh, the group policy Objects, if it's a U.S. company, it will be controlled by somebody in the United States. So they will decide whether they can pull up their pull up the data through cloud and bring it to the United States. So how is that how is how is that how is that jurisdiction going to work? Because if the U.S. company uh, the, the call, the, you call the shots in the United States, and I'll go inside and I'll open up, open up, open up GPO. I'll go to Active Directory, GPO, bang. I'll transfer everything down here from the server that's farmed in Europe, right to cloud, bring it to the United States. Nobody sees that, and that's what and that's what Microsoft has created because you know, I, I'm, I'm MCSS certified, so that's what uh, I've learned. There's no doubt that they can technically. You can take the because you know. Yeah, you can you, you can keep your servers them. anywhere as long as it's as long as you have the G if you have you know Microsoft uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 sitting on it, that's a that that's a best that's the best way to harness it. And we all you can create at least you know thousands and thousands of VMs on them and put it put everything up in the uh, in the cloud and start start manipulating your GPUs and Active Directory. Nobody will know unless somebody in NSA knows about it. So I think on that note, we'll uh, conclude for the day. Um, I have a couple copies of the book with me up at the front if you want to take a look. Uh, they're available on the American Bar Association's website. And uh, I'd like to give a copy to the Berkman Center um, being uh, hosting us today and hosting this past year as a research fellow. So thank you very much to Berkman. And uh, I'll give it to David as a <laughs> We'll do that after. But uh, John, any <laughs> any closing comments? No, I just appreciate uh, uh, everyone showing up on their, their lunch hour, and uh, I hope you found the discussion useful. And I would just say, you know, watch this space. Privacy and, and international developments are, are going to continue to be interesting to watch. And uh, I think that the the dialogue is just getting started. So. Uh, Keep watching, and thanks again for your, your hospitality. Thank you.